This episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks is brought to you by Gigabyte Motherboards and Graphics Cards. Gigabyte has promised us some next-level products to be unveiled at Computex 2019, so stay tuned to hothardware.com for future coverage. In this episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, Samsung and WDSSD's Fabulous Fractals, OnePlus, that's a king, Huawei's woes, and more <laughs> next. Um, now I'm getting alive. <laughs> I said, I said, Huawei's woes, dang it, as the cast streamed back in my ear and gave me feedback. Dang, it's hump day. It's hump day. Welcome back to another episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks. We are uh, just getting by by the skin of our teeth, right, gentlemen? Uh, as always, I've got Marco Cipetta and Chris Getting. Which one of you guys want to say hello first? Go quick. I'll go first this time. Marco always seems to go before I do. So, how you <laughs> Look, doing? It's Paul Lilly. <laughs> he got the Paul Lilly. We're credit. on our A game today. Well, you know, you've never given me a lower third for Chris. So, have you done like this every week? Really? You have <laughs> never had a lower third. Oh wow! Well, I'll make one. That's 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 John. We'll get there. That's you're hearing John for the first time, uh, who is the uh, man behind the curtain for us. He's the wizard of something. I don't know. Oz, whatever. Uh, hey, Marco, quit breaking stuff. Chris has I didn't break anything. Third. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's a – see, his is – all right. It must be Chris's fault because Marco's works. I blame Chris. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. We'll uh, we'll power on through this. Uh, so, how's it going? What's what's happening this week, guys? What's uh, what's new and exciting in Connecticut for you, Marco? Are you uh, you uh, living living large? I'm I'm living large. I am on daddy duty this evening, and for some reason, uh, girls, please keep it down. I'm going to be on my podcast translated into get the dog revved up and give her a squeaky toy. So we'll probably get interrupted at some point tonight. But you know, we're living the dream. What's what, what's that sign I saw it in, in Vegas at CES? Um, unattended children will be given a puppy and an energy drink, <laughs> something like that. that. That's what it's like in in the next room right now. There's a squeaky ball, a crazy puppy, and two little girls waiting for dad to finish the podcast. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Chris, do you have uh, squeaky toys and energy drinks? I've got an energy drink. I know you've probably got one. I've got the, uh, well, I don't know that it's an energy drink, but uh, the uh, oh, yeah. Dogfish Head Liquid Truth. Liquid, liquid truth. truth. It's, uh, oh, it's uh, made with a bunch of different hops and uh, different like techniques of getting the hops in from whole leaf, liquefied, pelletized, and powdered. So it's not too oh, bad. Wow. It's pretty well balanced despite all the hops. So not bad. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Wow, I like the name. Uh, liquid truth serum is that what it says? I, th mm -hmm. I think I figured truth serum was always liquid, so maybe that's a bit redundant. Just you know, truth serum. That's what they should call it. Maybe. Right? <laughs> I'm helping them with their marketing game. Meanwhile, I'm having something that you may have never heard of before, Chris. And, and we always like sort of get into our beers quickly before we have the cast. Only one beer per cast. But this, this is a serious one. This is Lord Hobo Museum Triple IPA. There you it go. is an eleven. It is eleven percent beer, and it is. I hate to say it, tasty. It is very tasty and dangerous. They should call it instead of museum. They should call it dangerous. That's what they should call it. That's the right marketing well, for that one. <laughs> I feel like the higher they push up the alcohol content on these IPAs, the smoother they get. So dangerous is right. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. Oh, Matthew Tripp says, uh, hey there, dot com. <laughs> Stanford University Graduate School of Business Impact Compass. Welcome, dude. Welcome. Welcome, Mr. Tripp. Think <laughs> tank repair. <laughs> what you, What are you laughing at, Marco? I think that's just a spammer bot just commenting in there. <laughs> <laughs> it might be. It might be. We'd like them, too, if they comment, you know. Uh, anyways, all right. Well, let's uh, let's dive into the headlines, um, Marco. You, I, I did hear the squeaky toy huh? down there. Is 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 the oh, dog? It's, uh, it's going. It, it's going. It's. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize to everybody. It's kind of cute. It'll get annoying eventually, guaranteed. But it's kind of cute right now. 
<laughs> All right. Well, well, let's uh, <laughs> let's let's dive in and uh, keep Marco on the move here while we can. Uh, let's talk about uh, Samsung's 883 and 983 DCT SSD review. That's like alphabet soup, dude. Enterprise class storage at consumer prices. Um, what do you think? Yes. So this was actually interesting. You know, over the years, we've looked at a lot of solid state storage devices and the enterprise stuff has typically been, you know, many multiples, the price of consumer stuff. But, you know, as, as TLC and 3D VNAN has gotten more pervasive and prices have come down and controller technology has stabilized and new interfaces like NVMe have come, things have, you know, they're, they're not on price parity, but things have gotten a lot more interesting. So I looked at basically the whole family of mainstream Samsung enterprise SSDs. The 883 DCT is the, are the, is the SATA family. They use the legacy SATA interface. And the 983 DCT, <clears throat> excuse me, are NVMe drives that come in two form factors. They have the uh, M.2 uh, 22110 form factor, so the longer gum sticks, or the U.2 two and a half uh, inch drives that look like, they look like a two and a half inch SATA SSD with different connector on there. So these are really interesting. The SATA drives, you probably know what I'm gonna say. They are bumping into the limits of the SATA interface. So the Can't sequential lights are, yeah, amazing. So sequential <laughs> reads are rated for up to 560 megabytes a second with sequential writes of up to 520 megabytes per second. The drives can absolutely do that um, with good latency, like. You know, I'll, I'll get to performance in a second. The the DCT, the 983, these are really wild drives. So the U.2 drives and the M.2 drives have different specs. Um, they both use this, the same Phoenix controller that's on many of Samsung's consumer SSDs. And they both both use the latest generation uh, Samsung 3D VNAND um, for their flash storage. They are rated for up to 3.4 giga, uh, gigabytes per second reads and 2.2 gigabytes per second writes on the U.2 drives and three gigs per second reads and 1.4 gigs per second writes on the uh, M.2 drives. What you'll see if you look through the numbers is probably what you expect for most of it. The NVMe drives are way faster in terms of sequentials. You can hit those greater than three gig per second reads. You will see those numbers in some tests. Um, also much higher IOPS. Latency is better than SATA, but what you'll see on those smaller transfers and in terms of latency is, you know, SATA is not bad. So if you need to save a bundle and you want big bulk storage, for example, um, I looked at a 3.84 terabyte SATA drive here. You can get big, massive drives that offer really good latency, uh, you know, and strong performance with those low 4K transfers, with those small 4K transfers. And, you know, these drives are only like somewhat more expensive than the consumer drives. Let me just jump to my conclusion, double check the numbers so I don't get them wrong. But, you know, the 883 DCTs are like 18 cents to 22 cents per gigabyte. And the much faster NVMe drives are only like 22 cents to 25 cents a gigabyte. That is more than a consumer drive, but not all that much more. Nice, nice. And some serious density available as well, right? What, what do they what do they go up to capacity wise? Uh, three point eight yeah, four terabytes. Yeah, data up to up to three point eight four, and the uh, nine eight three is up to one point nine two. So yeah, you know, basically two terabytes, four and two terabytes, basically. Sweet. So so tell tell the folks because they might not not know the the U dot two form factor interface uh your motherboard supported what, what 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 all goes into that because you do get some higher densities in in that uh form factor right that is not that's an m2 stick right there but go right, ahead that, that's the that's the m2 stick Th those are the satas um I, on the next page actually or at the bottom on the next page you'll see the u.2 drives so basically it's it's very similar to the to the m.2 just has a different connector and different form factor now there's two ways to use them in a system either your motherboard has to have the u.2 plug and you'll have a special cable that plugs into the drive or they make pci express adapters where the dri drives just plug into them and then you pop them into a slot yeah there you go and it's it's kind of like a a big honking looks like a fat sata cable almost Kind of yeah, sort of, it, really. it, it, it looks like a combo SATA and power connector on one end, and then the square U.2 connector for the motherboard on the other end. 
Yeah. Matthew Tripp, I think, is a spam bot. <laughs> That's my He's guess. Saying no, but man, is he chatty. <laughs> <laughs> Security uh, wow. clearance for IEEE sensors, outdoor home automation, career shadowing, elderly care okay. of which species. Chris, Chris, I think I think that's the goal is to get you to say his stuff. Uh -huh. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> You're gonna attract oh, but more. It's fun. <laughs> uh oh i got a black screen for that sorry sorry all right well so yeah so this is something interesting like you you wouldn't expect obviously the these are enterprise class drives at yeah. reasonable prices that consumers can afford reliability is there is there a better reliability story because they're enterprise enterprise class drives Sort of, yes and no. So they, they have a five-year warranty, but lots of consumer higher-end consumer drives also have a five-year warranty. Endurance is about the same. What they do have that most consumer drives don't have is end-to-end uh, -end data protection with power loss protection. Ah, so there are right. capacitors on board that would allow them to, to write any data um, in the event of a of a power outage what most people are I, I should confirm this with samsung i know this is the case with intel drives one difference with enterprise ssds is as soon as there start as soon as there are errors on the drive they will usually usually lock and you can't access anything to prevent any sort of corrupt data from getting copied to an array or what have you. So I'm not sure Samsung behaves the same way, but that's something to consider if you were considering an enterprise drive in a consumer desktop. But with the reliability of SSDs, probably not something most people have to worry about. Gotcha, gotcha. I wonder if your uh, internet connection is getting slow or if uh, if it's me. I'm, I'm generally pretty slow, but you know. You know what I'm saying. You were looking a little uh, pokey there. Hopefully, we'll we'll pick up Yikes. some speed. We got to kick the gerbils. Just kick the gerbils a, a little bit more on the treadmill. We'll be good. So, cool. Um, cool. So, so that's Samsung. And are those are those shipping now? Can we find them uh, Amazon and places like that? Or are we talking OEM? We got to wait till it's in the channel, all leaked out, or whatever. Nope, shipping now. They're out there. Um, prices were when I when I wrote the article. Prices were taken from Amazon and Newegg. So yep, they're out there. Beautiful, beautiful. Stop by the site. Check that out, Chris. You you all up in these drives or or what? Is this this well, your kind of yeah. Thing? I mean, when you can get the <laughs> the pricing down in that twenty cents a gigabyte range for NVMe SSDs, that's very very attractive. Um, Solid state's the future. It, it's it's the now. I mean, if, if you're still running spinning disks, you're kind of behind and really suffering from a poor experience. So yeah, yeah. I love seeing the point. performance increase and prices come down. It's great. Yes, yeah, so you can take a you can take an old laptop and uh well, maybe not with uh an M2 because it might not support it, but going from a spinning hard drive to even a SATA SSD, one of these guys. Uh, will make that older laptop feel new again. It is amazing, the transformation sure. when you're coming from spinning media. We've always said that. One of the best upgrades you can make is go solid state on your storage. And speaking of cheap and, um, you know, uh, price competitive SSDs, let's talk about uh, something from WD that Marco also took a look at. This is also an NVMe drive, the WD Blue um sn 500 ssd this is nb nvme performance dirt cheap now that's not to say it's it's um flimsy or or not well made it's just dirt cheap and it's from wd which is a trusted name in storage marco tell us more um yeah i will tell you plenty so this is a, a a really interesting drive because of its price so as you mentioned nvme m.2 ssd it's the WD Blue SN500. It's available in 250 gig and 500 gig capacities. So performance doesn't seem all that stellar in light of really high-end uh, NVMe SSDs. For example, 1.7 gigabyte per second max reads up to 1.45 gigabyte per second uh, max sequential writes and if you look through the numbers what you'll see is yeah it can hit those numbers it typically lands so i i tested it alongside kind of an, an array of 
higher priced and similarly priced mm -hmm. drives like the Crucial P1 and the A Data drive, but also tossed in a couple of higher end drives in there, like the SSD 970 Evo Plus, just to show you what's at the higher end of the scale. And what you see is that the SN500, it, it can't really compete in terms of sequentials. Um, latency is competitive with other NVMe SSDs. Uh, where it's really interesting, though, is low Q-depth 4K transfers, also competitive, lands about in the middle of the pack, maybe the bottom quadrant. But the price is only, at the time of, of the writing, it was only 13 cents a gigabyte. So basically the same price as SATA. And it blows a SATA drive away. So you can get much better sequentials in a SATA drive with better 4K transfers, better latency, um, for about the same price with that much better M.2 mm. form factor. So if you're looking for an affordable, you know, I don't want to say bare bones SSD because it is NVMe, but an affordable, decently fast SSD, it's a really nice drive backed by, you know, one of the, the stalwarts of storage by WD. Yeah, man. I just dropped a uh, link in the chat because this thing is an impressive drive for the money. 65 bucks gets you a 500 gig NVMe SSD that is capable of hitting like 1.7, I think you noted, right? Um, yep. Yeah, the 500 gig, 1.7 and 1.45 in, in writes, uh, gigabytes per second. And <clears throat> that is that is dirt cheap, as we said. <laughs> What's interesting to me about this drive and, and what we're seeing now with with drives from Toshiba as well. This is Western Digital. They acquired SanDisk, which is a big NAND manufacturing player, chip level NAND. Um, and so <clears throat> obviously really played well for WD, I think, that acquisition. They were they were obviously um, you know, paying attention to the market and the way things were uh trending back in the day. It was inevitable. Um, but um, so what you're seeing now is this. Oh, I don't know if it's probably 96 layer, maybe 64 layer, triple uh, TLC NAND rather, um, uh, 3D NAND that you're getting one chip and then the controller and a couple of passive components, you know, for power. And that's kind of it, right? On on the drive. Yeah. And so it's how they can get so cheap for, for 500 gig in, in a single chip. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, no, and no DRAM, you know, so it's like, <laughs> it's literally... Yeah passive components one piece of storage and the controller like that's it so you yeah. and you look at the pcb it basically stops you know 25 percent of the way up and the rest is a sticker <laughs> and there's nothing on the back side so yeah yeah good stuff um i am uh i am responding into the chat chris has uh blicked the spam bot <laughs> that's fine <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah, no, good stuff. And and what's the so let's see, the 250 gig. I wonder if they have that listed. That must be even cheaper. My God. The 250 gig, though, it's cheap, it's cheaper overall, but it's like much more expensive. It was only like 10 bucks gigabyte. cheaper. Yeah, way better yeah. to get the 500 gig drive. Spend the 10 bucks. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. So well, so Chris. For, would oh, you, if you're uh, building a budget gaming system, like there you that's go, kind of a no brainer. Um, that'll really help even hit like a $500 gaming desktop. You'll have fantastic performance. You don't have to go with the spinning rust in it. Um, and yep. you'll still have plenty of storage for your games. No brainer. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So yeah. Pick up a, a Z390 or something like that. Um, and, or an AMD board um and uh you know just uh, plug one of those babies in and yeah you can get you can get dirt cheap seriously good performance uh from the folks at wd anything else on this drive before we uh, move on marco um you would no, you recommend I, it to friends and family i i would if someone <laughs> wanted a cheap ssd i i would have no problem recommending this i will say after this went live uh, wd sent the uh SN 750 heatsink, they're higher end WD black drive. So I have just finished testing on that. I'll try to have that review posted in the next couple of days. Beautiful. And so it's it's got a heat sink, heat spreader on it. And you're no, thinking no, no. fat heat sink, <laughs> not a heat spreader. Really? Oh, fat really? thinned heat sink. Yeah. Oh, so this thing's gonna be, you know, three gigs a second plus kind of thing. 
Right, it's it's up there. So um, not to give away the review, but it it hangs with the uh, the nine seventy uh, Evo Plus. Ah, from Samsung. Yeah, that's that's good company to hang with. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So stay tuned in the weeks ahead for that from Marco, who is diving into the bits and bytes deeply these days with storage, as he uh, as he tends to do so well. Uh, it's near and dear to our hearts. We we do like storage because of the um, quick effect uh, that it can have on your system performance, the quick and um, and meaningful mm -hmm. uh, effect, the perceivable performance gain. All right. Well, let's uh, let's move on to. Um, to something that uh, Chris is going to share with us today because he's, he's, you know, man about town when it comes to uh, industrial design. We know that, right, Chris? Fractal Designs <laughs> Define S2 Vision RGB Case Review Premium DIY PC Chassis. And look at that RGB, buddy. You like that RGB, yeah. don't you, Chris? <laughs> I, th I think you got all the parts of the name in there. Yeah, the Fractal Design <laughs> Define S2 Vision RGB quite a name but a very nice looking chassis it's got it comes with the led um, fans so you can get a great look out of the box very easy controls uh, to cycle through the colors um, it is effectively built on the it, i mean the the s the s2 sorry i'm mixing i think it was the r6 r uh yeah, yeah the r6 skeleton sorry um, so if, if you've built with that, if you're familiar with it, it's, it's very, very similar to, to work with, but it has that extra bling, extra, uh, polish. It's has tempered glass panels, front, both sides and part of the top. Um, so obviously when you have a bunch of your RGB LEDs in there, you want them to shine through and tempered glass is a really nice way to do that. It is tinted. So you get a little more of the, the glow dispersion from it that looks really nice. Um, and it is toolless to work with as well. It comes with some thumb screws, keeping things attached out of the box, but you don't need those um, for, for daily operation. It hangs in with some uh, plastic bolts that secure it in. Um, so very easy to work with. Other than if you do want to change those lights, um, the, the button to cycle through is actually inside. So you need to to uh, remove the side panel to do that, which is a little mm -hmm. bit of an annoyance, but not a huge deal. Um, one thing I, I really like about this case that they thought about was actually for the GPU mounting. If you if you look at the back side of it, you'll see you have the typical seven PCIe slots going down, but then there's also two positioned vertically. So you can get your GPU in there and have it obviously vertically in the case to really show off the fans, lighting, um, you know, uh, there's some really nice looking cards out there and it's a really good case to to showcase that. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're going to have SLI cards or something, Crossfire, uh, they're not both going to be vertical in this case. Um, but if most people are using the single card setup because it just seems to be uh, the most compatible way to go for a lot of systems, uh, as SLI and Crossfire seem to be losing support. Um, so... You know, for those single card systems, it's a really great way to go. The The power supply section down below is also interesting because it, it clips your power supply into a bracket then then slides in the back. So you're not mounting the power supply inside first. You're, you're putting it on the bracket and then sliding it through um, into place, which if you have a fully modular power supply, uh, it should be pretty easy if you don't have a modular power supply. You might have to fumble with the cables a bit more, but it shouldn't be too difficult to work with. Um, and and speaking of cables, the because the backside also is tempered glass, you don't really get to like stuff cables in there uh, in uh, back like you you normally could get away with. Not that you necessarily want to be stuffing cables anywhere randomly, but. Uh, so, so as part of that, they they had some extra emphasis, some some nice grommeted areas uh, to to improve the cable runs in back, so you can keep a nice clean look, even though the cables are showing. And again, because the tempered glass is tinted, it's not showing off the cables so much, especially if you have, you know, black cables on a black build or something like that. It shouldn't be too distracting. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a great case to work with. It doesn't come cheap. I think the pricing was somewhere in the neighborhood of 
dollars yeah. for the case with the LED lighting, um, but you can also get it without the LED lights for a uh, for I want to say about half that. Where did the price go? Yeah, the blackout, which is two twenty three on Amazon. Blackout is two two twenty three or so. Yeah. Um, yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. So you don't need to have the the um, RGB lights in there if you don't want them. But you know, what, once you get them in there, set to a nice accent color, it does really look nice. We're watching Marco drink water. It's it's quite. Oh, sorry. It's quite it's quite interesting. No, you can drink. I mean, it was just the camera shot. There you go. Look at, look at. He's thirsty. He's thirsty, man. Uh, fresh and clean. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. We didn't. We didn't mean to digress, Chris. Um, sorry. Cool. Cool. The 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 fractal design define S2 Vision RGB. Man, they need to. They need to like really just condense the the word smithing. My goodness. Um, mm -hmm. uh, looks like a. Uh, I mean, when you talk tempered glass and. I love glass. You know, that's that's just a great look, certainly when you want to uh, show off your components. But when you talk tempered glass, this thing must be on the heavy side, right? Must be. Uh, I don't know what we got for weight on this. Yeah. So, so um, yeah. Actually, don't, I don't think we listed the weight. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it is going to be heavier than even, like, uh, an aluminum case. Uh or obviously plastic is going to be a lot lighter. So it's going to have some heft to it. You're probably not going to want to be bringing it to every land party you go on. Um, no. But with, yeah. with a reasonable desk, you know, should hold up just fine. It's got nice rubberized feet, so it's not going to scratch anything up. Um, and it's pretty spacious inside. You could fit up to uh, just over 17-inch PCIe card in there if you wanted to. I don't know where you're going to find a GPU that large. Um, so you don't have to worry about that effectively. And it can fit a 360 mil radiator. So plenty of plenty of cooling capacity, uh, lots of fan stock out of the gate. So uh, we did find that the airflow side of it, uh, it did perform very well, uh, nice and cool relative to some of the other cases we tested from Corsair. Um, so that was very, promising but it was a little bit noisier the soundproofing either wasn't quite there or the fans are just a little louder um mm. i'm not sure which but the cooling performance so, was pretty drastically better yeah uh, i quickly Marco, looked what, it up while you guys were chatting 32 pounds 14.8 kilograms about 32 pounds oh, not as bad as i thought marco what do you think about this guy i was going to ask you to chime in you are the uh, build aficionado of of hot hardware what are your thoughts um, on this I, thing I, I, I dig it. I have an R6, not it's, it's an older one that I'm going to build myself a rig in. Um, so I'm familiar with the internals. I actually really like these tempered glass cases. Um, <clears throat> when you have the proper channels on the back to hide cables, and you know if you use a system with an M.2 SSD, you're you're kind of eliminating a power cable and a data cable there. So you can get mm -hmm. something super clean, super neat that looks good from basically any angle and the lighting is really nice in this case one of the things so a different chris wrote the piece for us one of the issues he had and it's it's not a huge issue but to actually adjust the lighting you have to or adjust the lighting and the fans you have to use a controller that's actually mounted inside the case uh fractal hasn't gotten any certification to work um, they don't have their own software basically to control the, the lighting in there. So, but you can use third party apps to control it. It's just not like totally seamless out of the box, but mm. beautiful case. And Fractal makes really, really nice chassis. They make really nice cases that aren't too over the top. They're just stylish enough, you know, for, for my taste. I don't like really gaudy over the top stuff and, and they're much more understated and, and, and really nice to look at clean lines. So I, I dig it just a little bit pricey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, well, you know, you gotta you gotta think of <clears throat> personally when I think of a build, um, uh, I, I place some a fairly good stock in in the case because that thing is going to likely, if you think about it, it's an investment for an extended period of time. You most people, if you get a quality case, if you spend the money on a quality case, because you don't want to have these things collecting, right? Like once you move to another case, you're you've got baggage right <laughs> to throw out so mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> once you if you if you invest in a case and, a, and like like a quality case like this from fractal design you <clears throat> you give your your pc a home for probably generations to come um beyond the current generation of motherboards beyond the current generation of gpus and cpus that that you have and so it's worth investing in just like it is worth investing in a good monitor just like it's worth investing in an SSD over a hard drive. There are a few things, a good power supply. There are a few things that are key. You know, like you can, you can save a few bucks on a CPU if you're a gamer and don't get the, you know, the, you know, the, the 16 core or 32 core, whatever, you know, beast chip. You can, you can get a six core chip and get by as a gamer with a solid GPU. But <clears throat> that case, probably going to stick with you for a while unless you like you know you know migrating later on to a completely new case, uh, case and form factor and then having this leftover thing that you either need to sell or throw out you're probably going to live with it so it's worth spending a few extra bucks on a case am i am i right there guys am i off the mark no i i, I agree with you just um I agree with you 100%. Like if you're going to a case is something that usually lasts through multiple upgrade cycles. The the mm -hmm. only when I say it's a little pricey is like if you look at something like a Corsair 570X. It doesn't have quite the same accommodations for liquid cooling, doesn't have the same feature set, but it's a nice tempered glass. Nice really case, good yeah. looking similarly and it's, it's like 159. Mm -hmm. Now there are other like the the obsidian 500d is a similar price to this but then you can also go like the other direction um with a partially tempered glass rgb case from cooler master for like 80 bucks so like there yeah. are some nice cases you don't have to spend that much but if you want something high end with accommodations for basically any size liquid cooling loop you want to put in and any size graphics card like a no compromise case then yeah you know i have no problem spending over 200 bucks on a chassis but if it's, you know, if that is pushing it for you, there are still other options out there that are nice for significantly less. Yeah, I guess that's the moral to the story for this one. The Fractal Design Define S2 Vision RGB has, you know, the um, the room to move and to grow in uh, over the years um, as, as you perhaps evolve your system. Maybe you get into liquid cooling or something of that nature, custom liquid cooling, not just an all-in-one cooler for your CPU. And so, therefore, this is going to provide some some additional um, utility to uh, to support that. But uh, good stuff. Good stuff for sure. Chris Ledenikin uh, took, took a look at that for us at Hot Hardware. Stop by. He's got all the details for you and, and our full review of the uh, fractal design. Goodness, <clears throat> let's move on to mobile, and then we'll uh, we'll talk about our friends at Huawei, uh, who have some. They have some woes. Huawei woes. <laughs> Say that five times fast. I dare you. Um, but let's talk about mobile stuff. And uh, guys, you can you can give me your thoughts on this thing because. By gum, and I'm gonna. I'm just gonna say it right now. And I'm. I'm working on the review. I'm working on multiple reviews, which is, you know, just sapping my uh, life force. But that's okay. It's well, sometimes you got to grind it out. This right here is the One Plus uh, Seven Pro, and it is an absolutely fantastic phone. I'm just gonna say it now. The review is coming. I will prove it out in the review. Um, but this is a beautiful premium flagship Android device. Oh, I don't know what the color they call this. It's uh, some sort of cool midnight blue or whatever. Um, yeah, I'm missing the blue hue that they call it. It's a fancy name. Anyways, <clears throat> this thing is absolutely knocking my socks off. I am thoroughly impressed. And OnePlus, I'll be honest with you, I have a soft spot for them because they deliver such value for the money. This phone is is an absolute premium machine. So it's it's got a six point uh, was it six point four um, OLED display. I believe it's six point four inch OLED display. It is I'm sorry six point six seven inch OLED display. Thirty one twenty by fourteen forty resolution. Ninety hertz refresh. Okay, so. This is a beautiful OLED display to start with. It's also a high refresh display, high refresh rate. So 90 hertz. The thing absolutely pops. Now, I have historically always felt that Samsung 
produces the best displays for smartphones in the business. And by and large, they do. Um, I think DisplayMate, though, however, gave this also an A plus rating. Um, and this thing with its 90 hertz refresh, let's see if I can get it to do it for you on so you can see uh, you're not going it, to. It's really hard to appreciate. But when you see transitions, when you see animations and what have you, when you're when you're watching a movie even um, on this display, you actually notice it just pops that 90 hertz refresh rate, that high refresh rate. It just pops. Colors are gorgeous. It's well balanced. Um, so not not too cool, not too warm, but you do certainly have um, the ability to control color palette. They have different settings that you can pick um, in, in different um, color gamut settings specifically you can pick. But the display is stunning. And as you might notice, let me pull this in. I hope try not to get too much glare. That's really hard. Anyways, there is no notch. There is absolutely no notch and super thin bezel. So that 6.67 inch display um, is utilized across the entire front glass. It's also curved on each side, very much like a Samsung Galaxy phone. So curved glass on the front. And then the way they get away with uh, not doing that notch is by, bang, right there. Let me do it again for you. I'll shut off the camera. Oh, look at that. It popped up. Now drop it. <clears throat> There's the, yeah, exactly. Right there. Oh, you can drop it. That's the thing. Uh, actually, I could, hang on. There you go. How do you like that, Chris? That's ugly, right? It's bumming you out. I but, mean, the, you know, the, the zero G detection. <laughs> oh, I saw the, the zero G detection. Right. There you go. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I was going to say that in a demo, they actually hung a 50 pound block from that camera. But yes, the camera pops out. That is the uh, front facing selfie cam. I think it's brilliant uh, that it does that. <clears throat> and um, yeah, it's it's actually just a well executed device in in many ways. And it just the display itself, the build quality, um, I mean the the whole back here is is a flat, um, not a not a flat, but a matte sort of satin finish that resists fingerprints. So, I mean, like you literally, it, it, it takes work to get this thing smudged up and it still just looks great. <coughs> um, USB-C, uh, no headphone jack on this guy. Um, and then Snapdragon 855, uh, 12 gig of RAM and 256 gigs of storage. And you're talking, uh, let's see, I have to get the price on that. Yeah, so the 12 gig of RAM and 256 gigs of storage for 749, starting at 669 with six gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of storage. So when you think about an iPhone uh, 10R, for example, at, I don't know what it starts at, 799 or something like that, and what it offers. And then you look at this thing with 12 gigs of RAM and 256 gigs, gigs of storage at 749, and a, a uh, you know super high res um, 3120 by 1440 high res OLED display, bez you know completely bezel-less and no notch. Man, OnePlus just killed it, and I'm still experimenting with the camera. I think the camera game has come up dramatically. Um, all around, not only do they have that special uh, front-facing camera that pops up, but they have a, a, a three-camera array in the back, so you've got standard aspect, wide angle, um, and then telephoto. And it's just, I mean, really, it kind of has all the check boxes. No wireless charging, still, I kind of would like to have that. Uh, um, OnePlus sort of has kind of railed against wireless charging, saying it's just not that good yet it's not fast enough or what have you um but uh, no wireless charging and uh, no formal ip68 or ip67 water and dust compliance rating which again oneplus says to get you know the cost to to get qualified for that just isn't worth it and they try to keep the cost of their phones down so i can sort of relate to that you know i'm not going to go take this for a for a dip anyways but um man what a what a great phone so far and i'm just uh, just getting into the review and i hope to uh you know be able to uh, bring out the full review in the uh, weeks ahead what do you guys think about this bad boy it is a little bit large it's it's certainly a tall device 
but I got big hands, and let me tell you what, I'm liking it. <laughs> All yours, Chris. <laughs> All right. uh, you're just being, you're just being nice. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean that one I'm alone, not, Marco. I'm not a fan of the curve displays personally. I, I mean, I've got a SA in my pocket as my work phone, and and the the curved edges, I've just never taken a liking to. Um, it kind of messes with the edges of the display from an appearance look don't like the feel of it but that's just Hmm. me the rest of the phone looks absolutely gorgeous um i i don't hate the pop-up camera there because it is little some of the other pop-up cameras we've seen have been like the whole top edge of the phone going up um and that seems a little more prime for problems it'll be interesting to see how this handles dust getting in there over time um it definitely does seem like they they made it nice and sturdy um, the other part I was alluding to is if you have it open and you drop the phone, it'll actually detect that it's in free fall and retract the camera automatically, or or at least that's the claim. Uh, I'm going to try so it right now. It. I'm going to drop it. I was going to see if you would test now. that. I'm going to do that right now. Hang on a second. I'm going to drop it. Right, we gotta, I have to switch the camera over. Do I really? Well, th- no, no, the camera's on me still. There we go. Hang on. Hang on. Let me see if it works. I don't know if I, I'm not going to mess with my webcam because then I'll never get it back. Just drop it. It worked. Yep. It, it put the, okay. I'm gonna. I'm gonna show. I I didn't drop. I dropped it on my desk. Drop from it about your Just drop it from what? Just drop it from one hand to the other. Just catch it on camera. <laughs> yeah, next to your head. Yeah, but then I'll drop it completely. <laughs> Hang on a second. Hang on. All right, let me get this baby bit. Okay, it's a we're up. Fall. We're up. Okay. Hang on. And it retracted. Did you see that? There we go. There you go. Retracted. So it a did. little less it worry works. about it breaking, even if it's holding up to, to 50 pound bricks or whatever they were throwing at it. Uh, so that's that's really nice to see. Um, the the backing all fingerprint resistant is also nice to see. That's one thing about the G8 thin Q that I really don't like is it's just a fingerprint magnet, and they're really yeah. tough to get to get rid of on that phone. Um, but yeah. Fantastic price on this, even fully loaded at seven hundred and fifty bucks, is is a steal. Went two hundred fifty six gigs of storage and the twelve gigs of RAM. Um, great value. Now it has a massive battery, but with that ninety hertz panel, is it just eating up the battery, or or how is that actually holding up? That, my friend, is an excellent question, which I have not traversed yet. Um, I do not know. Um, Yes, as a four thousand milliamp hour battery, I believe, because it is a larger device. Um, mm-hmm. So theoretically, you would think with a four thousand milliamp hour battery, this thing's going to compete with the likes of, you know, a Galaxy Note nine or or some of these bigger phones that have these large batteries. Ninety hertz a refresh panel. Um, good question. Yes. Also, also a high pixel density panel too. So thirty-one twenty by fourteen forty. So you're lighting up more pixels and a higher refresh mm-hmm. rate. That's going to be interesting to see how it fares. One plus my I, I I run a one plus six T for my daily driver, and I can tell you that thing. I think it's thirty-seven hundred milliamp hour battery. That thing, <laughs> I I I I never have an issue with it. Um, and the fast charge with one plus is amazing. You drop it on the thing. And f- 15 minutes later, you've got, you know, if you were if you were dead empty, you got like 50% charge. Yeah, so I'll take a quick <clears throat> charge over wireless charging any day. I, I have a yeah. wireless charger and I've I've just never found it to be convenient. So for me, that's what I I like wireless charging, and I'll tell you why. I I tend to I don't have a um, you know, I can I can plug a USB, you know, cable into the computer and trickle charge off of that, no problem. But I don't have a plug easily accessible near my desk. And um, so wireless charge I'd have to put back here. And I'd literally like pop it on a chair, or excuse me, a wired charge. I'd literally put it back here in my office, pop it on a chair and just let it sit. Whereas wireless charger, I have a stand on my desk and I just sit down and drop it in the stand and it's always charging. So that's convenience for me. But um yeah i will say i'm I, I don't charge the thing a lot and like the one plus 6t i just and when i do it's like you know it's it's charged right. quick so so it's a it's about as good as you get 
without wireless, you know, charging the convenience of wireless charging. Marco, you you took a look at this thing as well. I know you've you've done a little bit of you know research on it. What do, what do you think? Is this uh, is this potentially uh, your dream phone? Because I know you I know you like them big too, buddy. Oh, I like some big. <laughs> So I was the, trying to get to do that before. <laughs> the size, yeah. the size wouldn't bother me. Um, the size is fine. I do. Chris touched on. I, I have a real concern with the pop-up camera lasting long term. I know that things it's built really rigid, but it's funny. You know, a couple of pieces of, of sand and dust get in there and throw everything out of alignment. Who knows how it behaves? So long-term prospects there. Um, we'll see. It seems like, you know, OnePlus is definitely known for maximizing the value, but it seems like some of the previous gens were sort of like no compromises for those value, for that value. Whereas this one has, you know, you technically don't have the water resistance certification. You don't have the headphone jack. You don't have wireless charging. So there's stuff that's missing from this one now, but it's stuff that lots of people may not care about. So they did make, you know, smart decisions on what they didn't put in the phone uh, to keep the price down. But it just seems like there are some compromises to get the price down on this one. That said, it's got all the right stuff ticked. Really nice camera, killer screen, super fast platform, big battery, lots of storage, good price. So obviously lots to like about it. Well, what I what, what I'm getting at with it is, yeah, you, you don't. You, there are some caveats. You don't get the IP68 water and dust compliance. You don't get the wireless charging. Um, that's kind of it. Um, but you're talking about a device that still starts at 669 and tops out at 749. And with those specs, like if you if you got a device with 12, you can't get a device with 12 gigs of RAM from. Any manufacturer that I'm aware of right now. Uh, oh no! Wait a minute, Samsung. Samsung. Uh, they they do. The full they uh, do. The Edge and the highest version of the S10 Plus. Yeah, the, but you're talking about it. At, so this is at seven hundred and forty nine dollars with two fifty six gigs of storage. You're talking about thousand dollar plus devices easily, probably more like mm -hmm. twelve hundred for those for those specs so when you think about the price tag yeah sure the top end flagship is still just south of 800 bucks it seems pricey but it's probably three four hundred dollars less than a similarly configured flagship from the few other brands that actually offer them and apple it's like ridiculously more expensive <laughs> to get these kind yeah. of specs to get these upper end specs so when it, <clears throat> what you what i look at is with with the OnePlus plus seven pro is 669 starting price gets you six gigs of ram which is still more than the average bear um you know i've got a pixel 3 x uh, pixel 3a xl which is a cheap phone for only has four gigs of ram um 669 six gigs of ram and 128 gigs of storage that's a nice still a nice storage complement to go with it as well so i still think the value play is there with a 4000 milliamp hour battery the high refresh rate screen 6.6 .6 inch display no notch all that triple rear camera you've got all that going for it for 669 to start i still think it's a a really good value and that's that's what i like about about one plus the other thing i like about one plus and i'm really droning on but i i you know I, this brand has impressed me um oxygen os is I, I have to say it I, you know and i've been i'm working on our pixel 3a xl review right now which is a great value in android phones um by the way for 400 and i think it's 479 with 64 gigs of ram and four gig excuse me 64 gigs of storage four gigs of ram that that android 9 pi os setup on the pixels it's it is so clean it's very clean and i appreciate that i like stock android i actually am now beginning to prefer oxygen os which is a very clean version that oneplus puts out of android 9 pi as well because they have just the right amount of additional features and accessibility that you know you need and there's sometimes where you know the pixel phones feel really like like flat, like it, I know Google's trying to, you know, make it clean, make it clean, make it, okay, it's a little too clean. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I, I got to swipe a little too much to get what I want. And I think oxygen kind of strikes almost the perfect balance. 
That's my opinion. No. I don't know how much do you, do you do. how much do you use the Google Assistant, Google Calendar kind of features where where the pixel really shines is kind of showing up your next appointment, just kind of nudges in and little little Google um, touches are, are where uh, so so I have a OnePlus 6T, and so I have the previous generation of this device and of, of the OnePlus 7 Pro, and I can tell you I use all of that extensively. I talk mm -hmm. to Google Assistant to fire up maps and say, hey, Google, let's go home from wherever I am. Um, my calendar, I use Google Calendar exclusively on my phone. I use Outlook and, and Google Calendar on my desktop, and I map the two. But on my phone, it's Google Calendar exclusively, and I get the notifications. I get um, all of that. Um, yeah, it's it is very much a, a an unadulterated Pixel experience, or I should say, Android experience, with mm -hmm. just the right amount of accoutrements to uh, to augment the experience. You know, just the hooks to get you where you want to go a little bit quicker in spots. Um, yep. The cameras, I will say the cameras on, on previous generation OnePluses and OnePlus models, not the best. That's one thing that they've needed to work on. I think they've addressed it with this, and I need to put it through its paces. I took it to Fenway Park with me the other night and um, impressed so far. Maybe not quite pixel quality, but pretty good. Pretty darn good. Most people aren't going to care. <clears throat> That's yeah. my thought, but it's initial thought. <laughs> Well, once they so, upload the picture to Instagram, it's going to wreck the quality anyway. So <laughs> true, true, true that, true that. So yeah, man. I mean, it's it's good stuff. Let's uh, we'll, we'll move on and we'll wrap up with Huawei. But uh, I tell you what, stay tuned for the review. I am smitten with the One Plus Seven Pro so far. I have yet to find you know that you know uh, caveat that really gives me pause. I am thinking. This I want in my pocket, you know, we'll see what happens, but I uh, got to finish it up, but good stuff for sure. So, all right, well, let's, uh, let's move on to uh, the controversial and, and, and lately all over the news, Huawei. Uh, and while we're talking on mobile, let's round table this whole Huawei snafu. Google yanks Huawei's Android license, leaving future updates, Play Store access in limbo. We saw... Huawei responds to Google's Android blockade, cites substantial contributions to the ecosystem. And then recently, just today or overnight, ARM severs relationship with Huawei and a crippling blow to the tech giant's uh, chip operations. Obviously, even when you talk about um, Huawei's, uh, I think it's Kirin um, uh, SOC, manufacturing mm -hmm. uh, chip plant for their, for their mobile devices. They license ARM core technology. You're talking about software and hardware and, and even IP ecosystem partners cutting them off. And I mean, I think, I think Google came back and a few others came back and said, you know, 90 day reprieve to be in alignment with the U S government. Um, but it's inevitable. What do you guys think about this, Chris? I'll, I'll, I might, might, well, let's tee it off to you, and then and then Marco will chime in. There's a lot going on here. It's all over um, the concern of of privacy and um, you know um, international uh, security and all that crazy stuff that you know we all get paranoid tinfoil hat over, but. Where there's smoke, there's fire, they say. I don't know. It just seems like, uh, you know, man, all of a sudden, they are the black sheep <laughs> in a big way. I, I wouldn't say it's all of a sudden. Um, and I think even even Huawei's known that this day could come for, for some time. Um, they've obviously been preparing for in the event of being cut off, break glass in case of emergency. They've kind <laughs> of been... Uh, they, they've been developing their own operating system. They, they're, uh, I don't exactly know what they're doing on the hardware side for, for chips, because as, as you said, the Kirin is ARM based. Um, they're licensing the IP there. So that is going to be a heavy blow for them. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, especially any other companies that might be using the, the Kirin cores outside of Huawei. Um, I'm not sure of any offhand, but I'm sure that they have some customers. Um, so it, it is 
a lot of complication. Um, you know, mm -hmm. is there their merit to it? That's not really a, a question I can answer. Um, so I'll leave that for others, but uh, that's definitely the way it's, it's looking right now. Mm. Marco, you probably have some strong opinions on this. What do you think? Yes, I have. I'm see. This is weird. The U.S. has obviously been out to sort of, I don't want to say discredit Huawei, but to limit their access to lots of things and and trying to get companies to not use their communications infrastructure hardware. So we're not just talking mobile devices like five G right. network stuff, um, communications infrastructure. All of that stuff uses ARM cores. Like if there's a processor in it, it most likely has an ARM core in it. And now that stuff could go away. So in the short term, this is a world of hurt for Huawei. No question about yeah. it. Everything on, from the software side to the hardware side, it's it's mad scramble mode. But if you step back for a second, like I'm, what I've been thinking about is do we, without clear proof, no one said, look what Huawei's doing. Here's proof of you know, them doing something risky, spying, what have you. There's been lots of accusations, no clear proof. Now, forgetting that for a second, with them cut off from all of this tech that's basically the foundation of their company right now, do we want a massive Chinese company with basically unlimited backing of the government developing now their, their own processors and own software and all that? What does this mean how much business are, are all these American companies going to lose because of this? Like there's potentially billions or hundreds of millions that is not going to come to the U S or to these U S companies because of this. And potentially you have, you know, a, a massive Chinese company with massive government backing, potentially creating competitors now to all of this stuff. So it just, yeah. it, it seems like maybe, you know, short-term pain and long-term maybe this hurts the u.s i really don't know i'm just talking that you know out of my butt but i don't know it's a really confusing situation <laughs> so yeah. one thing to yeah. look at mm. is you know being cut off from the play store and stuff is obviously going to hurt huawei internationally especially as they're trying to get larger in the europe market and stuff like that um but domestically, they're not really using the Play Store or Google services anyways. So that part of it, I don't think is is a big hit. Security updates are, are definitely going to be uh, what they are. So um, how much of that is they're able to maintain just off the open source stuff for Android or if they fork over their own operating system, that could be interesting. But you know, consider too that just how difficult it is for a Western company to compete in China. It kind of doesn't happen. If you look at the top of any industry, you're not going to find a non Chinese national company. Yep. Um, so depending on the market you're look at, it may or may not be as big of an issue for Huawei as, as we think, as we see as outsiders. Yeah, you know, and and I, I wanted to, I wanted to chime in on something Marco said here. There there hasn't been anything proven. There actually has Vodafone, which is a major European telecom uh, provider, uh, telecom company, actually discovered backdoors in Huawei routers from 2009 to 2011. Now, I don't know, you know, we 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 don't know a ton of the detail. I just dropped it into the into the chat. John, I don't know if you can see the chat. I, I I don't have a chat. Oh wait a minute, let me let me fire it up. Yeah, here we go. See, I, I, I don't I don't see that issue was known. I'm talking like their their 5G and communications infrastructure products that the, that the U.S. government's been really trying to bl even block other countries from working with Huawei through fear of backdoors. You know, the U.S. has briefed other countries on on whatever they feel is the evidence against this tech. And these other countries have still went and used the Huawei communication stuff. So well, it's yeah. cheap. I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess yeah. like there's just I think there's a lot more to the story than, than what's out there publicly. And, you know, there are open source CPU options out there like risk five is out there. Like imagine Huawei developing a whole you know, RISC-V based family of processors and just 
you know, continuing on their current trajectory with none of these, you know, U.S. companies making a penny from it. I, I don't know. I, I I shouldn't be thinking just about the money, but I think like literally could cost the U.S. billions long term. I, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that's that's a that's a valid point. I think there's um, you know potential for loss there. I think it's more, I think it's probably more short term than than long term um, for them. And you know, I think for us, I think that's I think you know, and I, I don't even want to get into politics, but I think that's what the the game Trump is playing. He's like, let's squeeze it, and yeah, we we might feel a little pain. There, there might be some disruption in the market, but we're going to be better off long term I, i'm not saying i endorse or whatever you know I, he he's 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 a he's a prickly prickly uh I mean, guy that that trump but, the economic but, the economic game that businesses have been playing with going to china for all right. their manufacturing because it's cheap and then china has right. easy access to the ip that they can just take and is a lot of the the chinese national culture for lack of a better word where if you have information you need to share it with the state and you know help the chinese people in any way you can because that's your duty yeah 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 well i think you know we should we should probably wrap but i you know this this game is uh is ongoing and uh i think marco you make a good point about sci five and open source silicon i think certainly they they can they can shift gears they can pivot uh the folks at huawei and i think they will um you know, uh, you know, given this, uh, these developments. Um, and so it's, but it's just going to take time and the short term pain is going to be difficult, but there's, there's a lot of talented engineers in that company for sure, by what they've proven in terms of product in the marketplace. And, um, yeah, they're probably, uh, probably scrambling right now to, to figure out what the game plan is long term, but, um, they've got a lot of horsepower. I mean, just, you know, one of the biggest telecom, uh in high tech companies in the world huawei wild stuff guys right wild <laughs> stuff. <Craziness. laughs> and you know it's it's funny you know you, you think about the, the 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 jobs we do and the and the, the companies we interact with we we've we've had plenty of briefings with huawei all their their stateside folks and their agency people are great people um you know so it's just it's a crazy thing, man. You know, you, you think about the power that goes on in technology and, and, and the, the countries that wield it and the companies that, that create it and, and wield it, you know, it's the new frontier, man. Tech is, is, uh, is gonna, is everywhere and affecting all things. So good stuff. Good stuff. Well, all right, we should wrap, shall we? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, on that note, <laughs> On that note, we'll invite you to come back uh, Wednesday. Marco, are you are you traveling next week? Not next week during the week. I leave next Saturday, and okay. then I'll be back before. So I should be okay for the next couple podcasts. So we'll we'll have you for Wednesday. Cool. So we we, we invite you back Wednesday nights at seven p.m. for our two and a half geeks podcast, where we try and hit that time slot wherever possible. And uh, find us at hothardware.com on the web, twitter.com slash hothardware, youtube.com slash hothardware vids or hot hardware, and uh, Instagram hot hardware. I mean, we're everywhere. We're the scourge of the internet in a good way, a technology good way. And uh, yeah, right, guys. Absolutely. Like that. <laughs> and uh, we will we will bid you adieu. And Chris says, "Cheers! Thanks for stopping by." Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Peace. Peace. <laughs>